getting stuff from A to B is one of the great logistical problems of our time and we just need to do better at it. We need to be more efficient, we need it to be more sustainable, we need to sort this out and that means experimenting. This little vehicle here is a very good experiment and it might be about to contribute quite a lot to this problem, more than you might initially expect. But what is it? Is it an e-bike? Is it a van? Is it a flex plant on wheels? Well, we're about to find out. Welcome to Fully Charged. Don't forget our great EV giveaway. Subscribe and enter for the chance to win one of several electrifying prizes, including one of four electric cars. Adam, thank you for having us visit. So the name of your company is EAV, which is EVE, right? So tell us what that is. So Electric Assisted Vehicles Limited. Um, we wanted to humanise the name, so give it a name like EVE. So it's all better, it's got its own it's name. It's got its own name, yeah. Well, I quite like that you're Adam and it's EVE. I don't know whether that was intentional. That was, that was completely <laughs> fluke, but uh, actually it works, works quite nicely. So what is EVE all about? So we wanted to basically engineer a, uh, a fit for purpose vehicle that bridged the gap between e-cargo bikes and vans. So all the benefits that e-cargo bikes give you, like pedestrian zones, but then all of the sort of comforts of not getting absolutely soaked in British weather with a roof and this sort of uh, product-like visual that we've got so that commercial companies can adapt um, their fleet mix to these sorts of vehicles. And where are you coming at this from? Because I think, you know, there's, there's loads of great ideas bobbing up at the moment and everyone's coming at it from different directions. So what's your way into this? My way is to listen. I'm a designer. I like to hear what the customer actually requires and then we build product for them. And actually we need to have a, a dramatic shift in how we transport goods and people. And what part of that, because obviously transport can involve big cargo ships and trains and lorries and what part of the game is this? This is pretty much strictly in the sort of last final mile um, arena. The reason for that is the, 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 usually the total cost of any final mile is 50% of the total cost of the delivery. Which is just astonishing. I mean, that's one that you have to listen to that. So 50% or more of, of the cost is just the last little bit. We're going to look at all the details of this, but just tell us a little bit to start with about what it's made from. So yeah, the, the things like the bodywork, for example, they're made from a natural flax fibre uh, with a bioresin. So, you know, technically it, it's end of life cycle means that we can actually do something positive with it, either biodegrade it or, you know, reuse it. We've got polypropylenes in the materials as well, which is obviously very recyclable. Just simple steels and alloys that we can also recycle as well. Part of our business model is also that we, that we control the life cycle of the vehicle. So we're going to do a subscription model whereby the vehicle comes back to us every two, three years and we repurpose it, upgrade it and make sure that the sort of longevity of these vehicles is, is sort of maximised over its, over its material life cycle. You know, you are quite new. There's all these incumbent companies, big ones and small ones that are hanging around. What reactions are you getting? I think it's, it's been widely accepted as a, as a good looking product. The best reactions that we've got is actually the pedestrians don't mind it at all. They actually could think it's, it's quite nice. Our customer's customer see it, see it as a very uh, positive product that, they're, that they're stu their goods are being delivered in. Cyclists like it in, in cycle lanes. We haven't had a, a mad cyclist at this yet. And also cars like it because it's got brake lights, indicators and all the rest of it. So we sort of adhere to a multitude of of people that could be offended by it, but at the same time, it doesn't offend. Does, it, does anyone not like it? Yeah, other, other cargo bike companies. <laughs> Fair. I think, I think we'll take that, accept that. <laughs> the competition doesn't like it, yeah. but apart from that, brilliant. Well, I'm quite keen to see what it does, so can we see it in action? Yep, yeah, let's go and have a test ride. So take us around the design, because you've, you've thought about every single little bit of this, so just Give us, show us what's in here. Everyone knows how to ride a bike, or most people know how to ride a bike, so it had to be very familiar in, in the terms of you sit on it, you pedal it, you steer left and right. 
It then has an added layer of sort of automotive features like indicators and brake lights, etc. But essentially, it's very simple. You pedal, it gives you assistance, and you reach a, a speed that you've set it to. So it's an e-bike in the sense that it's it's regulated as e-bikes are. It's got the same top speed. It's got the same uh, limitations on power of the motor and all of that kind of stuff. And so we've got handlebars in here. So it's sitting in here. You're just sitting on a little in a bike and the battery is is that it there is that yep it? so this is a removable battery we spec the battery size dependent upon the customer's requirements for its its days worth of use there's no point specking a battery that can do 100 miles if you're only going to do 20 miles a day we generally spec the battery to the size um, that they require and they can have multiples of batteries as well okay. um, but the, the the standard battery that we do will do about 35 to 40 miles and during our development process we've obviously recognized where parts fail under the loads and the stresses that we're putting them under in this scenario. One of the most interesting parts of it is actually, it doesn't use normal bike tires. Because we're, we're dead upright, we don't lean our vehicle, so we develop these tires with Verdestein. They're quite chunky, aren't they? Yeah, they're, uh, they're incredibly high load rating as well. They'll do 175 kilos per corner. You know, the top speed limit is at 15 miles an hour, so it, presumably it, it could go faster, but with cargo, you're unlikely to be taking it faster than that. And I think there's, there's lots of discussions around whether that's, that's not fast enough, but in my head, 50 miles an hour in a cycle lane is, is more than adequate. And when you're carrying quite high loads and your gross vehicle weight is, is relatively high, you want to be able to make sure that this thing can stop, maneuver, avoid a hazard, um, and be able to do all of that in every weather condition imaginable. So what's what around here? So you've got uh, your power on button, which is on the left hand dashboard. Yeah, power that on. And on this dashboard, it basically gives you five settings. And those five settings are related to your, to your speed. So it's like so a that's push a control number function. Here. Yeah, so five is obviously 15 miles an hour. And you can reduce that down to, you know, so I'd probably put it on two for now. <laughs> Get used to it. Fair enough. You've got a little left hand thumb throttle there. So that, that gives you up to six kilometers an hour, which is the legal limit for like a walk assist. That's the indicator. Yeah. Oh, so you can't leave your indicators on because exactly it beeps at you. You've got gears as well to change your cadence, but the, the pedal set That's is it. not directly linked to the motor. Um, now, the way I'd start it is I'd use the thumb throttle, and you can, it's got quite a nice bit of variance in there, so if you sort of gently start going with it. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, um, the camera that is just there should probably be... <laughs> <laughs> There's almost no effort needed to put in on the cycling here. Um, I'm not doing very much exercise, it has to be said. But every time I touch, it really picks up quickly. up down the runway and it feels like I'm about to take off <laughs> and it feels like this vehicle could top speed here we go. <laughs> I'm still a beginner at this but Adam is an expert and he is making this vehicle do some things that I certainly wouldn't dream of. Here we go. Just watching a vehicle do that at the, with that kind of speed is terrifying. Like it's only going at 50 miles an hour and watching it, it's just scooting around these obstacles. And the serious point here is that if you're on a road and you need to avoid an obstacle, you can clearly do it. What is absolutely ridiculous about this is that I can pull the handle handlebars around all the way. The wheels are at such an incredible angle here and I can stay upright and I don't fall over. And it feels like it feels so wrong to just, ha you know, to, to, to turn a bike wheel that much and all of the engineering keeps the vehicle stable. It's amazing. They're doing their manufacturing on site here. And what I like about this is that 
you know, their product is novel, but actually some of the ways they're making these vehicles are pretty new as well. However, it does still involve a good spanner, and I can see quite a few in their workshop here. So we've got to the shop floor here. Walk us through the process, what's going on? So yeah, currently we're just trying to blueprint our production process before we move into our larger facility. Um, so really sort of pinpointing down, making sure that we've got all the right nuts and bolts. And actually, if we can get away with like having three bolts rather than four, making the production speedier, um, standardizing parts, etc. That's, that's what we're trying to prove out here. You, the bottom bit of this is made out of steel. Why is that? So we use a tubular steel. Um, it's a specific kind of steel that uh, because we use the, the tubes as a torque tube throughout the chassis. So we've got active suspension, but without any moving parts. So, I mean, suspension is quite interesting because one of the things, you know, most bikes don't have suspension, but you've actually, you're building this into the structure here. Yeah, so we, we, it's an active chassis. We call it our cloud frame chassis. Um, cloud frame, that's cloud a new frame. one on me. Yeah, so what we tried to do is that when we, when we first started talking to uh, customers, what they don't want is maintenance. They, they want absolutely zero maintenance. Um, so the, more, the least moving parts you can have, the better. It means you've got less parts to go wrong. So what goes on top? So our bodywork basically. Um, as we've discussed, it's made out of a uh, natural flax fibre composite. Um, the fibres look a little bit like this. It's, uh, it's knitted. This yeah. is genuinely knitted. What is this stuff? So the stuff that you've got in your hands there is a uh, natural flax fibre and polypropylene co-mingled material. Um, that's the future of our, our production. I'm fascinated by this because it's, flax is clearly a natural material. We know it's used for make it, been used for making ropes for years, that yeah. kind of stuff. We know it's a good structural material. I've never seen it used to make a structural component. So there's, there's fibres of flax and then the polymer sits around the flax. How, how does that work? I mean, if we go back to the sort of the start and why, why we want actually want to use the, the fibres in the first place, obviously it's, it's a byproduct of producing flaxseed, uh, an unused byproduct in, in general, that in theory could be grown in a field literally around the corner, processed by ourselves, made into a material that can then produce components like this within a mile radius of its source. And that, for me, is where I want to go with the, uh, with the process because we shouldn't be sort of importing goods from all the way around the world, expelling loads of energy to just move materials and components right. around. That's not sustainability in my mind. So let's just go through the process. It arrives with you in, a, some, in something like this, is yep. that right? And what happens to it next here on site? So we'll have a, a female mould. Um, it will obviously get draped into the mould, vacuumed down using a vacuum bag, yeah. and then literally thrown into an oven at uh, about 190 degrees, cooled down, and then it pops out a part that looks like this. And you can make it any shape you want within reason? W within reason. Once you understand the material, you can then design components around your material properties. So it's got lots of nice sort of properties for commercial applications that, uh, that far outweigh the, the sort of the competitive uh, materials that are out there on the market today. Uh, sustainability is one of those words that means a lot of different things to different people. But when I think of sustainability, I think of, you know, we live on a planet with a fixed number of atoms and basically all those atoms have to go round and round. And it's not about recycling being this alien concept. Part of sustainability is you have to make things out of the waste of what went before. Yeah. So this material, I mean, flax sounds biodegradable, but once it's got a polymer mixed in with it like what what happens can it be recycled can it be reused so what happens it's a melt out process and then you can separate the two materials off one can be thrown in the ground and the other can be recycled over and over again what i really like about what they're doing here is that they started their design really from the bottom up they looked at the very raw problem and they designed a vehicle to solve that problem. So it's not just a case of them having made a great toy because it's a great toy. They've really listened. And I have a right be in my bonnet about this. I think that we need engineers to listen more to what the world wants. And that is absolutely what they're doing here. I think it's brilliant. So here we are at Ocado and this is an Ocado Eve, just like the others, but this one, this one is an Eve Cool, which means it's got a refrigeration unit inside it. So we're going to follow this along on one of its journeys.
Well, you've just got shopping in mystery brown bags. What do you think of the transport we've got here? I think that's fantastic because one of the problems, of course, with home delivery is cars clogging up the roads and emissions and parking. So it's lovely to see something much more environmentally friendly delivering my shopping. So, Adam, we've just been following these around the streets. What's it feel like to see them on the streets? How, how do you feel when you see them? It's quite nice for me. It's nice to sort of analyse how people react to them from, the, from both the road, from the pedestrians and the cyclists as well, which is always, it's always been quite positive, really. I really notice cycling in London that you notice the fumes, you know, especially when you're stuck in traffic. You sort of don't want to breathe in. Yeah. Um, and low emission zones are becoming very popular. So how do these fit into all of that? I think where these, these will definitely come into their own is, is, yes, low emission zones are important, but actually it's pedestrianisation and, and the, the growth of those ULEZ zones and the pedestrianisation zones that mean that vans will not be allowed to go into the centre of cities anymore. And that's where these take over. So we made an episode about e-cargo bikes a few months ago. And at, when that episode went out, I got a few emails, a few tweets saying, oh, well, they're nice little toys. Well done. They're very cute. They're never going to scale up. They're never going to be a solution. It's always just going to be a niche thing. What is your reaction to that? I mean, I think people, people are afraid of change. You know, um, I think COVID has been an accelerator for change and actually people are a lot more open-minded now. People that, that are sort of negative towards them, they don't really see what the future is and they don't really see that the vehicle is going to be pushed out of the city centre quite rapidly. Um, not in sort of 10, 20 years, in, you know, within a year, within two years. Paint us a picture of the streets around here if the world goes your way. <laughs> if Adam was king of the world for the so, next 10 years and you could reorganise transport, what would it look like? So we call that project Transport Futures for Eve. So we're already, we're already thinking about that. We're already working with uh, large blue chip corporate companies um, to, to basically brutally change the way you transport goods and people around the city centres. It's not necessarily about electrifying fleets because it's just seen to be green but Doesn't you're not really, really change changing much, anything yeah. and I think as the governments try and roll out their, their, their zero emission goals they're going to have to turn to companies like ours that don't have any legacy operations don't have any legacy vehicles that are uh, you know 10 years in development and they have to sort of you know expel their, their R&D costs over another 10 years we can start from fresh with a clean sheet of paper and design something that's actually fit for purpose for the, for the problem that we have right now. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been lovely to spend time with these vehicles and to see them out in the wild. And it's a great project. I wish you all the best for the future. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been really great to spend time with these vehicles. I am all in favor of experiments and I think this is a very good one. And honestly, the thing that excites me most about this is this material, the idea of taking using flax as the basis for a composite to turn it into a material which is strong and flexible and tough but is also recyclable. That, I, I'm very excited by that. I think we need more of that. And then the vehicle itself, you know, it's, it, does, it, it does a job that needs to be done and it'll take time with all of these things to work out how it fits on the roads, how it fits within with other things, you know, all of these experiments, but you have to do it to find out what's going to happen. So yeah, I think these are great. You know, the technology is impressive. I, I'm really keen to see where they go next. So that is it for this episode. And if you have been, thank you for watching. <laughs>